Education and Parole Mental Health and Addiction Peer Support Program. We also have Outreach, which provides harm reduction and resources um, in partnership with One City. And we have a Justice and Court Peer Support Program as well. So we'll start with Corrine in the Justice Programs. Um, so our justice programs um, for the court pieces are open to all, um, 18 and up. Our bail program is ministry run and it is open uh, for individuals 16 and up of all genders. Um, referrals can come to me, however, it can be streamlined depending on what services um, they're needing and a lot of our referrals for bail um, come from the courts directly. Um, just speaking about who is eligible um, for bail specifically, these are people who would otherwise be released, um, which is one misconception of our program. So um, these are for individuals who would otherwise be released, but um, lack the social supports and the financial supports in order to obtain release um, in the court process. Um, so they do have to go through an interview process with ourselves uh, to determine eligibility. Um, people that are eligible are people that are waiting trial, a remand uh, for like a bail hearing, people in custody unable to meet um, surety releases or cash bails and appealing a bail decision. Um, one thing that I wanted to note um, for our bail program, specifically for um, the domestic uh, piece of things and the domestic violence is because it's a ministry run program, we do have standards that um, are handed down by the ministry. Right now, none of those standards actually are um, written specifically for domestic violence. However, there are discussions right now with the ministry on how to better support um, or how to determine eligibility if the charges are related to domestic violence. Um, so right now that is in the works. There has been nothing to come down from the ministry to bail programs at this point, but it is an open discussion that we have regularly with the ministry and other bail programs across Ontario. Our justice services case management and support. Um, so it provides a long list of services um, that inter um, sect with all of the other um, agency supports that EFRI offers. Um, specifically, these are people that are going through the court system though. So we do offer uh, case management for people that are going through um, the court process. Um, and we do things like navigating the court process with them. Um, trying to assist them in mitigating their circumstances based upon what the charges are bringing them um, before the courts. Um, we do offer other things like our community service hours, um, which is a part of the justice case management and support. Um, we do offer peer programs um, for people that are going through the court system. We do advocate navigation um, and essentially just kind of meeting people where they're at in the court system and walking them through it. Um, a lot of our uh, clientele struggle with cognitive difficulties um, or they are struggling with substance use or they're struggling with mental health concerns. And the court system is really designed not to be the kindest to those individuals. So we try to do our best to assist them through that process and advocate and uh, provide a voice for those uh, who their voice may not be heard. We do work very closely along duty council um, and we do have meetings with Crown's offices um, in order to ensure that um, everybody is on the same page. And if we can advocate for an individual going through the court stream to mitigate or lessen their sentence, uh, that is what our primary focus is for support and advocacy. We do um, partake in two specialized courts. So we do, um, we are actively involved in the community support court, which is for those who have cognitive um, cognitive disabilities or people that are um, experiencing struggles with substance use and mental health. They can apply uh, to be seen in a specialized court and the court is actively uh, looks towards a treatment plan for resolution purposes. Um, and we're also actively involved in the Indigenous Peoples Court. We do hold the um, coordinator position at EFRI. Um, and that court is fairly new. Um, however, we are an active role in being able to um, deal with the uh, Western colonization of Indigenous um, folks going through the court system and advocating for uh, more traditional healing practices. Um, so we do hold the position for that and we do have a voice uh, in that court system.
There we go. Thank you, Corrine, for wrapping up the justice programs. Does anyone have any questions for Corrine in the justice programs before I jump into community programs, just so that you don't have to wait until the very end if there's something she talked about you'd like more information on? Everyone's good? Okay, perfect. So I'll move into community programs. So in the community programs, part of EFRI, our programs are open to all women, men, and gender diverse community members 18 plus. So originally EFRI was opened as a pretty much women only um, agency with the impact, when, no, I shouldn't say that, when we got our bail program, we did open up that program to men as well. And with COVID, there was a shortage of services for men that are going through the court system here in Peterborough. And we, you know, you, you're supporting a lot of women a lot. In, so much until you get to the point where eventually you want to stop it from happening altogether. And so by providing supports and educational programs to men, we can hopefully stop those issues from reoccurring. So our community programs are open to all individuals um, to make a referral. You can feel free, just email. You can just send me an email with the, the individual's name, their contact, or clients can reach out to me on their own. We always try to promote autonomy here at eFry. So there's my contact information there. It's um, just an S at eFryPTBO.org, or you can call uh, my, my number, which is 705-957-7456. Usually when somebody reaches out to us, I have a student that will return the client's call and they will support the client in registering in all the community programs. So for community programs, we offer eight sessions of supportive counseling. Um, it's, uh, there, there's no wait list, so it's kind of a great alternative to get somebody in if they need a listening ear until they're able to get somewhere that offers long-term support. Our supportive counseling is done with our students under supervision, so it is just supportive counseling. It is not therapy or anything intense like that, but it's, it's a listening ear that they can do once a week, once every week, or once every other week as much as they like with our students. Um, our, we offer one-on-one -on -one programs. So programs that we offer include anger solutions, healthy relationships, self-esteem, goal setting, anger solutions for men, healthy relationships for men. And there's a bunch of other ones that the students have been creating during COVID. Those programs can be done in person with one of our students, over the phone with our students, or they can do them online. So our online programs allow our service users to access material any time of day and at their own pace. So there is no need for them to worry about keeping appointments. They don't need to worry about arranging childcare, missing work to come in and get their programs done. They can access that material anytime. And it is a learn at your own pace. So there's a mixture of videos. There are questionnaires, surveys, um, there's homework. And there's also voiceover for a lot of the programs too. So if somebody wants to um, just listen to it or if they learn better, it makes it a little bit more accessible that they can do the programs um, that way. We offer groups as well. Um, we have been doing them virtual, but we are hoping to get them in person going into the spring. The groups change all the time. Um, I'm happy to send out a list of the, the groups that we have going on right now. I believe it's just an ambiguous loss group that we have right now, but the students, they come up with stuff all spring. So there'll be new things coming out once they get started in the next semester. And then there's our STEPS program. So our STEPS program is kind of what runs all of our community programs. We used to take two placement students every semester. With COVID, we got ambition or ambitious and we're up to about 17 students that come in. Um, this spring, there'll be 17 of them. Most of our students have lived experience with mental health, addiction, poverty, homelessness, domestic violence, um, and criminalization. So we provide a supportive placement experience for them to meet their educational requirements while also receiving personal support. Um, any supports that we offer, we offer to our students as well. It gives them just a nice safe learning environment where they can uh, kind of share their lived experience with service users and offer just a stronger connection. So there's just a couple of our one-on-one -on -one programs. These are most popular ones that we will re receive referrals for. Um, CAS, probation and parole comes through these ones. Um, these are also programs that our court worker will do with clients as well when they're going through the court program. So anger solutions, healthy relationships, self-esteem, truth and integrity, anti-theft program. Again, all open to men, women, and gender diverse people. Anyone is welcome to take these programs. Uh, yeah, our online programs available 24-7. There is no, no time of day they can't access it, which is great for anyone who's 
more of a night owl than a nine to five <laughs> type of service user. There's a list of a few of the programs there. Um, again, they do change all the time. <coughs> Students are always creating new ones, but I can, I'd be happy to send out a full list of what, what we have going on online right now. Um, there's just a little bit about the STEPS program, which I just kind of <laughs> dumped ahead and, and kind of explained a bit better. Um, our STEP program also has extended into offering students support before they apply for college now. So we have individuals who have lived experience and want to um, give back and want to enter a career in social services or mental health and addiction. We support them in preparing for that. So we help them with academic upgrading, GED prep. We help them in applying to Fleming College. We also provide assistance with applying for financial aid, navigating OSAP. Um, we do supportive counseling, peer support with them as well, as well as mentorship. So a lot of them can expect to enter into a role as a peer worker when they're done school, if they have lived experience and we prep them just a little bit more so they can learn about setting boundaries, how to balance their lived experience with the experiences of service users, just to kind of make them a little bit stronger when they enter the workforce. Um, they're also offered a guaranteed placement. So by the time they come to the placement part of their education, they come right back into EFRI where we already know who they are, they're already supported and we can uh, create a placement experience that best fits them, their, um, their strengths and their needs. So people often wonder why it's so important to offer students <laughs> or to offer support to students. Um, when we started having placement students, so far since 2019, I've supported over 60 of them with placement. And at least 80% of our students have lived experience with mental health, addiction, substance use, poverty, homelessness, domestic violence, and criminalization. It's quite often why they come into this line of work. I think if a lot of us were to look at our own lives, there's probably something we've encountered at some point in our life that has led us to working in social services. Um, and so we want our students to be successful and to see that their lived experience is valuable, that it's not just education based, you know, that in their career, that the things that they have been through are valuable too. And so our goal is to ensure that they receive personal support and accommodations to make sure that they are successful in their career and that they're going to do good things going out and um, supporting the community members in their future. I've just included a couple of testimonials because the students always make me smile. <laughs> so. <laughs> Feel free to read them if you like, <laughs> but um, I'll read one out loud. So <laughs> struggling with mental health issues like depression has made post-secondary education difficult at times. It's hard to concentrate and remain organized. Having lived experience of poverty, mental health, domestic violence, childhood trauma, and homelessness has made me more empathetic to the plight of others, which has enhanced my understanding of the SSW program. So just understanding that students also have, um, have a need for support and people who are supported make better employees. So if you support students right from the get-go, they, they, go, they go forward as better employees when, when you're hiring first-time workers in this field. Some of them are quite long, so <laughs> I'll let Chelsea go now with her peer programs. I've um, talked enough. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the last section, won't be much longer. Um, so I'm the peer support programs manager. Our peer programs are open to anyone over 18. Um, we can't take anyone under 18 just because of the funding through Health Canada, it has to be adults. Um, so we're open to any gender. Um, we're, our program runs 24 seven. So for both peer support and harm reduction supplies, um, other than us, there's nowhere else in Peterborough that does harm reduction after 7 p.m. Um, so it's not very often that we get calls in the later evening for harm reduction supplies, but it's just important to let people know that we do do that 24 seven. So if there is a need um, for some of those people that are like an SM mentioned, not the nine to five folk um, and are more, you know, overnights, um, we do offer that. Um, the call and text number is the main peer support line. So it's 705-768-4334. And we have different peer workers that staff that line 24 hours. Um, so you might not reach the same peer worker if you call at 9 a.m. on a Monday, if you call 9 a.m. on a Tuesday, but they all connect very well with each other. So often we'll get calls from someone's client and we're able to pass that information along to the proper peer worker. Um, but it's nice to have different peer workers because we never know who someone will connect with. Um, and when someone calls in crisis or something's going on, um, usually whoever's gonna be on the phone is someone who's able to support that person. And if they're not, we have such a good connection within the community and within our agency that we're able to 
offer support to people um, in different ways. Oh. Sorry, the screen's not changing for me. Okay. There we go. Um, I should mention that with the peer support program, so the main program is funded by Health Canada, and I'll talk a little bit about this after. Um, and then we also have a program funded by probation and parole through the Solicitor General. Um, and the requirements are slightly different. So with the Health Canada program, which is our overarching um, peer support program, there has to be identified substance use for the person to qualify for the program. So whether that's past substance use, like they could be in recovery for 20 years, that's fine. Current substance use or someone who can identify being at risk, um, especially at risk of overdose. And then the other program, probation and parole, um, the MAPS program, that one, it can be substance use or mental health. However, the referrals have to come directly from probation, or if we get someone referred in a different fashion, like sometimes it's through the hospital or whatever it might be, we can connect with probation and parole to say, hey, this person has been referred, they've given us consent to speak with you, um, to just let them know that they're connected to the program. Nothing else goes back to probation and parole. It's a one-sided consent. They send us the, like the referral for the person and that's it. It's up to the person if they want that information to go back to probation and parole. Um, usually it's like, yeah, you can tell them I completed this program or like that I'm still connected or things like that, but we don't give any information back um, that the client doesn't want. So the peer support programs in general um, are just support that offer emotional and practical support between two people. Um, usually we try really hard to assign, when we do an intake with someone for peer support, we try to assign them to a worker that is going to be beneficial to them in what they're looking for goals. So we ask people like, are you interested in going to 12 step meetings? What kind of recovery are you looking at? Do you want safer use, lower risk use? Do you want abstinence? What are you looking at? And we try to match them with people that will be helpful in supporting them through those things. So people that have lived experience of homelessness um, or who um, have like, like we have one um, peer worker who actually has a CYW. So she's very great with like supporting parents who have children. Um, either the children have substance use issues or the parent does and has the children. So um, we try to do things like that. We have the court support peer workers who have lived experience with criminalization. So they work closely with the justice program case manager um, to offer lived experience support through the court process. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. Everyone has like a little niche kind of specialization that we try to like move people um, towards what they do. Like we have one worker who works specifically with people who don't have contact information and are living rough. Um, so he drives around and meets them where they are, offers support um, and does what he can to try to like track those people down that aren't able to come to the office for appointments um, or don't have contact information. Um, so we try our best to offer the support to people in the way that they're looking for and through the person that would be most beneficial to them. However, that person is never stuck with that peer worker. Like if something, if they identify like this is not working for me, I need something else, we can definitely move them to a different peer worker. It's very flexible. Um, we try to meet our, meet our clients where they are in their lives. There's no agenda to peer support other than supporting the person in the way that they would like to be supported. A lot of it ends up being system navigation. So people that um, need advocacy to get back into shelter, people that um, are experiencing mental health and don't have connections to CMHA, don't know how to go about doing that. Um, we also do appointment attendance so we can go with someone to do a warm transfer. We often go with people to the RAM clinic. Um, we also work inside PRHC. Um, so we're contractors within the hospital. So we have badges that get us into any spot in the hospital. So we often get referrals from them, we do rounds twice a day. So we check in at different stations and say, hey, is there anyone that can be referred to us? Anyone that has identified? Um, we get consent first. The hospital gets the person to sign the consent form. They send it to us um, and then we speak with the person. So there's always consent before we talk to anyone, especially because you're being referred somewhere because you've identified substance use. You don't want someone coming in your room and being like, hey, the doctors told me that you use drugs and I'm here to talk to you about it. So um, it's very, very uh, much rooted in um, consent and making sure the person understands and the person at any time can say, this is not for me, I'm done, don't want it, scrap the consent and that's it. Um, there's also no end date to peer support. So the person can be on the program as long or as little as they like. 
They can meet with a peer worker as often or as little as they like. Um, obviously, we have boundaries around like meeting daily because our caseload is very high. Um, we've been running for just over two years, technically just under two years for connecting with clients. And we've had over 500 referrals. Um, so 500 individuals referred and several of them have been referred more than once. Um, so it gets very hectic, but each person identifies their own needs and what they want out of the program. So some people are very, very like low support needs. They just want to chat with someone once a month to vent about some stuff. That's great. Um, sometimes it's just they need someone to connect them to somewhere and that's it. Um, and sometimes we have other people that want specific weekly support for an hour um, where they can work with people towards their goals. Um, all of our peer workers have lived experience with substance use specifically. Um, all of them also have mental health, though that was not a condition of employment like substance use lived experience was. Um, and we also have various experience throughout um, the population of poverty, homelessness. Many of our peer workers identify as 2S LGBTQIA+. Um, we have Indigenous workers, we have cultural workers. We try to span what we can um, to make sure that people are getting appropriate support and referred to proper channels for what they need. Um, okay, so I talked a little bit about a different approach. That's really the overarching peer support program that MAPS almost fits underneath. Um, the only difference really is that MAPS, the, the referrals have to be, like the person has to be on probation or parole um, to qualify for the MAPS program. Um, so it's a free 24 seven program, nothing costs clients anything to be a part of peer support. Um, we also offer lots of resources and different things. So we often have gift cards. At one point we had cell phones. Um, we always have clothing, food, different things like that, um, because we recognize with people a lot of the times that resource support is really important to being able to start looking at other things. Like it's really hard to start looking at mental health or substance use if you haven't eaten in three days. Um, so it's very important to us to like kind of help people stabilize in that sense before we ever start talking about anything else um, because it's not beneficial to them. Um, so I talked a little bit about how clients are assigned to peer workers based on what they've identified. Um, the referrals can come from anywhere. I've listed a couple places on here, like hospital, police. These are like where our main referrals come from. Um, but we often have people that come in through another peer, like their friend has a peer worker and they're like, hey, I would like a peer worker also. Um, we have couples, we have um, people that just self-refer, we get referrals from different programs within EFRI. Um, so really it's, it's very easy. We try to make it as low to no barrier as possible for people to get involved. They can text, they can call, um, they can talk to another worker, whatever way they get here, that's fine with us as long as they get here. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more, more about MAPS. Um, so MAPS is through probation and parole. Um, I saw Sam Brooks is on the call, so I'm trying to do this justice. Um, but so we get the referrals from probation and parole. Um, or like I mentioned before, if we have clients who are connected through another way and identify being on probation and parole, we ask them for consent to connect with their probation officer just to let them know, hey, they're connected with peer support. And then we also get their end date of their probation order or parole order um, because technically their support ends from MAPS when their probation order ends. However, we can flip them into a different approach. So the regular peer support program so that they don't have to end their peer support there so they can continue if that's something that they're interested in. Um, the same support is provided by MAPS workers as it is through um, a different approach. Um, and there, there is a specific MAPS worker. However, if we identify that someone who has come through MAPS would be a better fit for a different peer worker based on what they're looking for, we'll just move them to the other peer worker. Um, so we also have a harm reduction and outreach program. We've recently moved the outreach um, to one city. So for our drop-in, we do at one city Monday to Friday from 12 to four. Um, and there's all kinds of resources there. So we do harm, rec harm reduction there, clothing, um, there's survival gear, um, there's peer workers there, there's always food and coffee. Um, and also the one city workers and volunteers are there as well. It's also helped us like a couple of weeks ago, we had someone who hasn't reported for bail that happened to show up and mention, hey, I've been trying to get in touch with my bail worker, but I don't know how to do it. I don't know what to do. I don't have contact information. So we were able to support that person in not getting a breach for not reporting for bail because they showed up at the drop-in and connected. And then we were able to connect them to their bail worker. 
Um, so part of it is really trying to reach those people in the community that have gone MIA or don't have a way to contact or show up for the things that they're mandated to do. Um, so it's really helped us. And then through the connection with One City, it's really nice to offer kind of wraparound support with what they do as well. Um, but we also offer harm reduction at the office. So the office is the 24 seven um, option. Uh, we just ask that people either call or text after hours if they need support, because there's not always someone here. There's always someone on shift, but they're not always at the office. Um, we do work from home sometimes. So like if someone calls at 2 a.m., it's not very likely the person's going to be at the office, um, but they can get here, get the supplies and get it where it needs to go. Um, so yeah, drop off is available. Just depends if someone is able to do it at the moment. You might have to wait a couple hours depending on when it is. Um, but we do um, make a point to be able to deliver to people. And if we can't do it and it's during PARN hours, PARN also delivers. So we will work with PARN to see who can do it quicker, who can get the person what they need faster. Um, so we try to do like partnerships with people. Um, and then with our outreach, so along with One City, we also do outreach throughout the community. Um, so part of that is certain peer workers that go out and drive around and support people. Um, sometimes they will have specific days and times. We're in the process of solidifying it right now, um, but they'll have specific days and times and areas where they are. So for example, like Parn used to do certain times at one roof during mealtime so that they were there and able to hand out supplies. Um, so something like that, where we're trying to set up that we're like in this area from 12 to two. And if you need harm reduction, you can come and see Efry in the parking lot at Murray Street Church or something like that. Um, so more information will be coming out about that. We just got a grant for it. So it's a little bit in the process of being created. Um, but yeah, I think that's all I've got. That's the end. Um, I will mention we do have a housing program also that is in the process of being revamped. Um, the original funding we had for it ended on March 31st through United Way. So we're working out how we can support clients um, ongoing with housing search, um, going to apartments with them to look, contacting landlords. How can we support people into getting affordable places um, or like people that have difficulties in talking to landlords or securing apartments or staying in somewhere. We try our best to be able to support someone in building those skills. Um, we also have clients that are in apartments right now um, that initially we signed the lease. And then the goal is after six months, eight months, I can't remember. I don't work in the housing program. I'm sorry. Um, but after six or eight months, the goal is that the person would then sign their own lease in that apartment. Um, so we work with them through that time to build skills, look at financial options. How can we get subsidies? What can we do to support you? Um, what do you need to be able to move into this apartment independent of EFRI's support? Obviously, we'll still support them um, if they'd like, for sure. But the goal is for them to sign their own lease and then that apartment is theirs. So... Sorry, I just rambled a little bit, but I didn't have a slide in here about housing. So I wanted to add that in there as that's something that's definitely upcoming. All right. Any questions about anything 